the contemporary art world is vibrant and booming as never before. It's a 21st century phenomenon, a global industry in its own right. Brilliant Ideas looks at the artists at the heart of this. Artists with the unique power to astonish, challenge and surprise. To push boundaries, ask new questions and see the world fresh. In this programme, Yinka Shonibare. Welcome to the magical world of Yinka Shonibare, the British Nigerian artist who works across a variety of forms, including painting, film, sculpture, and dance, creating pieces that are full of wit, color, and fantasy. Being an artist is a form of dreaming in a way, because what you do in your art is quite different from the reality of the world. Being an artist is a, is a place of escape from the terrible things that have sort of happen in the world. And I like the complexity of art. It's a very, very complex thing to be involved in. It's not easy because no one will give you answers. And I like the challenge of facing blankness and creating out of blankness. I'm somebody who likes to sort of reflect and think about society generally and express things in a very engaging way, but in a kind of fun way. My name is Yinka Shonibare and I'm an artist. With Yinka, he's stepping sort of so beautifully between issues and between forms of work. And he said himself that his job as an artist is to create a wonderland, to enchant, to engage people. And that's the beauty, you're seduced into these works and little by little they reveal themselves. What's so exciting about what he does is that he does things with a lightness of spirit. I think a lot of artists feel they have to carry the weight of the world on their shoulders, particularly artists from you know, the African continent, and to see him address really important issues in a light-hearted way that entertains the audience is, is a really important part of what art making's about. So here is someone that looks into the detail of the history, looks into the detail of each piece that he's crafting, and he's able to marry this glorious sort of decorative piece with politics. He explores serious issues in a way that is always humorous. And there are very few artists, I think, who feel as comfortable as Yinka does, sweeping the past, engaging with the present and asking questions to his public. Although he was born in London in 1962, Yinka grew up in Lagos, Nigeria. Nigeria was independent when I was growing up, but a lot of the British influences were still left before the military regime was a kind of a free and vibrant period. And I remember Fala Kuti, the Nigerian musician on TV, being, you know, sent into jail. So that kind of defiance I kind of saw, you know, artists kind of are seen as outsiders who challenge the system. My parents were shocked when I said I wanted to be an artist. I think they would have preferred me to have gone to law school. My father, my father was a lawyer. At 16 years old, Yinka left Nigeria for England to finish high school and attend Wimbledon School of Art. I only did that course for about three weeks. And then I passed out in the college, basically. I woke up two weeks later 
um, and um, I was told that I got a virus in my spine, and, and then I was completely paralyzed. I couldn't move anything. Yinka had contracted transverse myelitis, a virus in the spinal column, a neurological disorder that hinders the spine from communicating with the rest of the body. And I subsequently had to learn to do everything again. Then I had to learn to, to drive and get myself back to art school again. But the important point is, you know, if you have to get on, you do get on. And also it depends on the personality of the person. I want to get things done. I'm very excited about what I do. So disability is just finding different ways of achieving the same things. When I went back to art school, I was introduced to politics and I was kind of engaged in, in politics. So I made work about perestroika, basically, that was going on in Russia. One of my tutors saw that and said, well, why are you, you know, making work about Russia? Why aren't you making authentic African art? I needed to find out really what he meant. And I was looking for uh, what authenticity, what might constitute authenticity, really. I just found African masks and, you know, ritual, African ritual objects, which at the time I felt had no connection to my modern African life. Challenged by his teacher about why he wasn't producing art that looked African, Yinka found inspiration in Brixton, London. I went to Brixton Market and found some fabrics there. So many shops around Brixton buy here. When you come here, you get everything you want. My favorite one is this one. I like this color it's very, very much. We call it Obapa. Obapa means good woman. We use it for dresses. Men use it for shirts. And women, we use it for clothing that says slit and kaba for Africans. And these ones are two for 40 pounds. I always imagined the fabrics were authentically African. And then I was told that the fabrics are Indonesian influenced fabrics produced by the Dutch. But I liked that history of the fabric and I liked the um, global connections and the kind of trade routes of the fabric. The fabrics are a very good metaphor for a, a contemporary African existence, if you like. That's um, how I started to incorporate the fabrics into my work. And Double Dutch was uh, one of the first pieces I made on the fabrics. Created in 1994, Double Dutch is a series of small square paintings influenced by the Dutch wax cloth. Now, with his own take on African authenticity, Yinka was on the verge of a breakthrough. As a young British Nigerian artist, Yinka Shonibare was working in London in the 1990s. His signature use of Dutch wax cloth was gaining him recognition within the art world. I was in an exhibition with a friend and Charles Saatchi came in. Charles Saatchi was collecting a lot of art at that time. He was collecting contemporary art. In fact, he was probably the only person collecting contemporary art. He liked my work. Soon after that, I then sold my work to Charles Saatchi. Even Yinka could not have known how much this chance encounter with Charles Saatchi would affect his career as an artist. Finding his stride, he won the prestigious Paul Hamlin Award in 1998. The Paul Hamlin Award was an award for my projects generally. I'd moved into photography by the time I got the Paul Hamlin Award. I had photographs on the London Underground, a series called Diary of a Victor and Dandy. I was influenced by visits to the Victoria and Albert Museum where I saw a number of Victorian costumes and then I was thinking about my background and the colonial influence in Nigeria. The Paul Hamlin Award made it possible for me to give up my day job and focus on everything I needed to do with the work. 
in truth, I wasn't very aware of Yinka except by name until the Sensation Exhibition at the Royal Academy, which I think was the autumn of 1997. Seeing him and his work take its place on this stage of exciting contemporary artists was a revelation to me. He was different in the gentleness and the exuberance and what seemed to me the optimism of his work, yet infused with a slightly menacing, strange undertone. I have such a vivid memory of first seeing Yinka's work. The first piece I saw was Mr. and Mrs. Andrews without their heads, and it was on display at the V&A, the Victorian Albert Museum here. Somehow it was the first time that I could see something that related to my own history as someone from African Caribbean heritage, but living here in the diaspora, living here in London. I developed what I describe as ethnicizing the aristocracy, uh, which is uh, using those um, fabrics to produce ar aristocratic dress. I decided not to show the heads because I didn't want my figures to have a fixed race, and I wanted to be more like metaphors as opposed to specific individuals. And of course, I also, you know, did that in the beginning as a joke about the French Revolution when the um, guillotine was being used and um, the aristocracy had their heads chopped off. And uh, so that was just like, a, you know, uh, started as a joke. In the 19th century, uh, there was a conference in Berlin and the conference was known as the Scramble for Africa. The European countries took it upon themselves to do this without actually asking the local people if, that, if that's what they would actually want. Quite difficult to force people together to be in a country. Nigeria being a very good example of that, and that's really a legacy of, of um, colonialism that's been explored in that work. I found this building in Hackney I do works on paper and I do those here. So a lot of the ideas are developed here. Depending on how much work is required, I work with a number of uh, fabricators. A fellow costume maker was approached to work with Yinka and felt that her cutting skills weren't up to it and thought that it would be up my street, so, and it is, and I, I love it, and I've been doing it ever since. Dee is very good, and she's able to interpret what I want, and it, you know, it seems to work quite well. Most of the communication happens through Alva, who would be Yinka's right-hand woman, the whole creative process comes about through Yinka and Alva having a meeting and discussing costume design that they figure will wear, and, and Yinka chooses the fabrics. This is what we would get from Yinka. The fabric's cotton, so it, it's not a difficult fabric to work with, but the patterns create a, a challenge in themselves. And visually, I always feel as though the patterns should be mirrored on the body. That's a challenge because they're always in quite a dramatic pose. The patterns aren't symmetrical. I think Yinka has referred to it as his voice, so I always think of that. So you have this person that's both an artist and a designer, something in between, but he's also a political activist, if you care to look beneath the playfulness. He's also a philosopher. Here's someone that uses cloth to speak about many things. In 2010, Yinka turned his hand to public art 
and on the grandest of stages. Nelson's Ship in a Bottle for London's Trafalgar Square. The critically acclaimed work is now on permanent display at the National Maritime Museum in Greenwich. Nelson's Ship in a Bottle is the battleship of Admiral Lord Nelson, who won the Battle of Trafalgar. I basically put HMS Victory, the ship, in a, in a giant bottle with African textiles for sales. It was very well received, uh, you know, it looked magical in Trafalgar Square. It related directly to Nelson and the whole panoply of sort of imperial might and the establishment of the British Empire. But at the same time, it plays fun with it and rather ridicules it because he puts his flagship into a bottle and turns it into a souvenir. Working across a variety of forms, from painting to public art, performance and film, Yinka's latest focus is on environmental issues. Celebrated artist Yinka Shonibare is known for his bold and colorful work, which engages with contemporary issues. Yinka's recent exhibition in New York, Rage of the Ballet Gods, explores climate change with globe-headed Greek gods. But this isn't the first time that he's taken on big subjects through metaphor and imagery. I made uh, um, a work called Black Gold, which is dealing with the issue of oil. Oil represents 90% of Nigeria's export wealth, wreaking great devastation to local communities, to the environment, setting up polarities of wealth and poverty. And he made a piece called Flower Cloud, which was a really beautiful ballerina, larger than life size, on point on top of a seething, broiling black cloud of oil. And of course, Yinka was playing with ideas of this so-called elite art form, ballet, and who watches ballet, who in a sense owns ballet, but making something extraordinarily beautiful. My work is not about uh, trying to preach politics or uh, being moralistic about what people should do. But essentially, they're, they're kind of you know, poetic, poetic explorations, really, of, um, you know, of, of ideas. I'm in sympathy with some of the ideas of William Morris. William Morris was a socialist, and he was very inclusive. He believed in an egalitarian society. There's a complete meeting of minds, I feel, between William Morris and Yinka. Both have this joy around the decorative, both have a political side, both have a philosophical side. And so both of them, for me, epitomize this idea of art for everyone, beauty in and through the everyday. I mean, he wanted ordinary people to have nice designs, but, you know, ironically, no ordinary person can afford them. Um, you know, and... Um, but things are kind of very well crafted and, and um, you know, very nice. So I very much um, like what he stood for in the spirit of William Morris's egalitarianism. I wanted to produce a project that was inclusive. So I got the members of the public in Walthamstow to reconstruct his um, family albums. In William Morris' family album, we begin to see Yinka move away from that more obvious connection to Africa. We see William Morris' family cast in a new way. 
there are brown faces, there are black skin faces, there are Anglo-Saxon faces. So we begin to see this idea of what makes up a contemporary family. Yinka Shonibare's celebrated position has enabled him to be an artist for the people. Within his studio, there's a project space, a platform for emerging artists to show their work. Generally, the idea is to have a more of a kind of socially engaged studio. And the idea is also to encourage independence. They fund their own projects, they raise money for their own projects, they do the marketing, and they put up their own exhibitions and they get a residency in the space for one month. But they're free to come and go as they wish. They, they can either use the space to make work or to uh, just do the exhibition. And, and they do a number of education projects like screenings and talks and, and so on, or parties, you know, it's up to them really. We want to cast a net far and wide, get as many people to come down. It's about broadening the community and getting people into the space. And any art form, it's not just art, fine art. We'd like to have dancers and circus performers we've had before. So it's just a way to mix things up a bit. It's become quite expensive around this area as well for artists to rent a space. So while it's got a great reputation and a great audience around, sometimes um, there aren't the opportunities for the actual artists and new artists and young artists who aren't already established to show their work. Things are different now in the sense that art's much more established as a profession. When I was growing up, it was actually a profession to avoid. I don't, it was not even considered as a profession. I think it's good that there is a proper market, and especially as the world has actually opened up. So art has become much more global. The art world is different because of his presence. It's enriched by his presence. He has exercised influence by releasing people from some of the conventions that they've worked within in the past. I think that he absolutely inspires and makes one feel that anything is possible. It's very accessible, so you're able to talk about difficult issues like difference, post-calamity and race and culture. It touches on all of our need to belong, all of our searches for family. And I think that's the strength of this, because it shows that there's a connection between Yinka's work and everyone. You know, the human experience really is what he's talking about. His voice has been heard for a while, and I think he's influenced a lot of African artists. He's part of the establishment, and that's not something that we would have expected 20 years ago. He just wants to make really good art that he's proud of, and, that, and that's a real inspiration. <laughs> 